Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Lauren Israelson, president of the United Natural Products Alliance. I am here this morning on a beautiful Monday, September 20, speaking to my old friend and colleague, Mark Blumenthal, founder and executive director of the American Botanical Council, and oh, so much more. But today, I asked Mark to get on to this uh, <clears throat> quick interview with us to talk about uh, one of the most um, troubling problems that the global botanical dietary supplement industry is facing right now. Uh, we all know we're dealing with a global supply crisis. Everything from lawn furniture to food, TP, uh, everything's affected right now for a host of reasons. We're not gonna get into all of that. What we do wanna talk about with one of the masters of the subject is botanical dietary supplements. Um, what is Mark seeing right now in terms of the, the state of the market. And a very recent herbal gram was a fascinating piece on the adulteration of elderberry. So there's two things, Mark, I'd like you to, to uh, share with our, our viewers. Number one, what's your sense of the tightness of the botanical supply chain, given that the majority of our supplements are imported from overseas? Mm. Second, in times of short, uh, guess what happens? Adulteration, they go together as always have always done. Uh, we'd love to get your insights. Um, any heads up, particular plants of interest that we should be looking out for, advice to uh, companies and to the industry, vigilance and testing. Uh, with, uh, with your team uh, involved in botanical adulteration uh, prevention programs, um, you raise, and I'd like you to touch on this if you don't mind, is the continuing problem of mm. adulterated material cycling around and around um, inside the industry and how we get rid of that stuff and the likelihood in your mind of that increasing. Uh, and how, what can we do to support ABC and its mission to uh, both educate consumers and make sure that we are adopting best highest practices when it comes to botanicals. So Mark, uh, thanks for joining us. The floor is yours. All that in seven minutes. Thank you so much for for uh, <laughs> including me in, in for your you. Eight. For you, eight. Eight minutes. Okay, great. I see I negotiated an extra. Uh, grateful for this uh, opportunity to share what's going on. Very challenging to find out what's really happening. And back in April of 2020, just like we were in the second or third, fourth week of lockdown, the industry was going through a lot of changes. People didn't know what to expect. We sent out a, net, a notification to our members at ABC and basically said, beware of adulteration because when supplies get tight, we can predict, we can be sure. We, it's inevitable that some people with uh, less than adequate um, ethics, if you will, uh, are going to substitute, they're going to mislabel, they're going to misbrand, they're going to find different ways to try to satisfy increasing demand with short supply. You mentioned elderberry, I believe we have published the first peer-reviewed article ever on elderberry adulteration. And elderberry is shooting through the roof. I mean, 150% increase in mass market uh, or more uh, demand in, in 2020. Uh, we don't have the numbers for 2021 yet because we're still in it. Uh, elderberry, very strong demand because of its leadership position with a reputation of being uh, useful for helping prevent and or treat various symptoms associated with upper respiratory tract infections. Interestingly, it takes four to five years at least to get fruit from an elderberry plant. You can't just plant elderberry in response to demand increase and expect to be able to harvest any fruit from it in the first or second, third, or even maybe fourth year. So it's a long-term commitment for elderberry. And fortunately, there are many reputable, responsible, ethical suppliers who are already in the elderberry business who have adequate stocks because they have been anticipating they didn't anticipate COVID and the increase there, but they anticipated general increases in demand for elderberry, which has been growing over the last years. So there are companies that have adequate stocks or hopefully adequate stocks of true authentic elderberry, but there's so much more out there in the marketplace called elderberry. It's hard to tell what is really um, true or not. So there are no published scientific articles in the peer reviewed literature on elderberry adulteration. There are on many other botanicals, unfortunately, but there are none on elderberry. So we published the beginning of this process of establishing some baseline understanding that elderberry is being adulterated by contacting four independent 
uh, laboratories, analytical laboratories, and four in-house laboratories at various companies that are in the elderberry business, and getting their data as re with respect to what they've tested as far as ingredients, as well as finished products. And we found, according to the compiled data, four, 532 lab tests through all these eight laboratories, that 11% of those tests showed elderberry being adulterated. Now, some people might consider that to be a relatively small amount, but remember, these are people that are sending materials to laboratories from customers that are already in the business. So you can expect that there's gonna be a high degree of pass and a relatively low degree of failure. We don't, that isn't necessarily representative of the entire market, but we don't know yet. We're trying to expand that paper and publish on even a larger universe of lab tests to see what's going on and eventually have an elderberry uh, botanical adulterant prevention bulletin that we will publish through our program. But right now there are no nowhere for us to go other than our own published data so far, although other uh, research groups are uh, working on this and they'll be publishing in the next couple of years. So there's a paucity of data on elderberry specifically to confirm adulteration other than what we've been able to, to collect from industry sources. Got it. Thanks, Mark. What are the other hotspots you're seeing, elderberry being one? Um, what else is on your radar? Well, we have a lot of things on our radar. We've published uh, 23 uh, botanical adulterants bulletin so far on our website at the uh, Botanical Adulterants Prevention Program, which is part of the American Botanical Council's website at herbalgram.org. Anybody can go there and get for free uh, something like 67, I think it is, peer-reviewed publications that we have uh, published for the entire world botanical community, anybody who wants it. Uh, we are currently working on Ginkgo, a lab guidance document. We've already published a uh, but botanical adulterants prevention bulletin on ginkgo but now we're doing a lab guidance document it's going out for peer review i believe this week and we have i think something like 50 different analytical methods that we found in the literature to test for ginkgo some of those uh, uh, research uh, or methodologies are uh, adequate some are inadequate and that's part of our program we're looking at analytical methods to determine whether those that are published 10, 20 years ago, perhaps, that may be used in various in-house laboratories or third-party laboratories, whether those um, lab methods are still fit for purpose. Are they still usable and reliable in today's market where adulteration, types of adulteration change? And so the methods used to detect that adulteration may no longer be valid and people could use an older outdated method, end up, yeah in a correctly authenticating some material and buying some material that is actually inauthentic. And, and this is a continuing problem, Mark, that you pointed out many times and it's worth repeating is that uh, the, uh, the folks that are engaged in adulteration are often good chemists um, and they're always ahead of the market. And that's the problem. Right. So uh, it's how we stay vigilant and stay ahead. Keeping in touch with ABC's news and updates is critical. Uh, given the fact that so much of our stuff is coming from India and China, um, and we're in the middle of COVID, no travel, no on-site visits, uh, it just kind of is that perfect storm that, that uh, you really can't make this stuff up. Um, any advice on, in our, as a closing thought, Mark, um, responsible botanical companies, um, in addition to all that they're doing now, what else can they additional steps that they can take to both protect themselves, protect their customer, and uh, do whatever due diligence they can with the constraints in place at the moment. Well, thank you. Uh, people need to, to uh, double and triple down on their testing procedures, their, anal their, their reliance on appropriate analytical methodology in their testing laboratories, and they need to properly authenticate and qualify their suppliers. They need to make sure that their suppliers are testing material as according to FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, before they even ship it to the customer. In other words, buy from people who are reputable, buy from people who are known quantities, buy from people that you have a high degree of trust in. The old expression, trust but verify. The difficulty in verifying is you can't necessarily send your people over to China or India to watch what's going on in a particular facility, uh, given some of the limitations on, on travel, et cetera, with respect to the pandemic right now. But you need to work with people that are reputable suppliers. There are many good companies that have long history of, of appropriate botanical extraction facilities, uh, 
cradled to the grave, so to speak, or you know, from, from field to, to shelf types of, um, of quality control and sustainability and transparency in the entire supply network. There are good companies who really qualify their material very well and authenticate it. You can deal with those people. They are available. Uh, when you use price as your primary specification, you are putting your company at risk. You're putting your customer at risk. Thanks, Mark. Well said. Uh, and I would also say that uh, for those that are interested in who are these good companies, uh, I, I would in part say, take a look at who's supporting ABC. Uh, that's a pretty that's a pretty good start to uh, give you a roadmap to to look for the the best of class. Mark, thank you so much for joining us on this Monday morning. Uh, this is an ongoing story. I am sure we're going to be back uh, wanting some updates and further insights as uh, we all navigate this thing together. So uh, thank you for the work that you've done for this industry for uh, scores of years, uh, almost more than one can count. And uh, we appreciate everything you do at ABC which by the way is a, is a uh, partner of UNPA in many projects. Uh, we have long supported ABC, will continue to do so. And uh, so there it is everyone. Uh, we're in the midst of a very interesting time. Keep your heads up, uh, keep your microscopes and your labs busy and continue to support Mark and the good work at ABC. So Mark, thank you and talk to you again soon. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate the opportunity. My pleasure as always.